friends, colleagues, students and visitors, welcome to the Dean's Lecture Series, showcasing eminent international professionals and leaders in the built environment. My name is Julie Willis and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. I begin this evening's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which this event is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri from the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders and families, both past and present. This is the first lecture in the Dean's Lecture Series for 2019, and it forms part of our BE150 initiative, which is running through 2019 in celebration of 150 years of built environment education at the University of Melbourne. The year 1869 marks a significant point in time for the inception and evolution of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. In that year, exactly 150 years ago, a student joined the university with a specific and expressed intent to practice within the built environment field. While the 150-year milestone acknowledges and celebrates built environment education, the BE150 program is much more than a simple celebration of our legacy. It allows us to explore the contribution of our faculty is making and will continue to make in shaping the future of built environment forms, disciplines and professions. A key component of this is to provide opportunities for students, staff and the broader built environment community to engage with thought leaders and innovators across design. Tonight's lecture brings a world-leading architectural historian, theorist, researcher, curator and author into our faculty's built environment community. Beatrice Colomina is Howard Crosby Butler, Professor of the History of Architecture and Director of Graduate Studies in the School of Architecture at Princeton University and is also the founding director of Princeton's interdisciplinary program in media and modernity. She comes to us this year from her fellowship at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Berlin where she is for the academic year of 2018-19. Beatrice has written extensively on questions of architecture, art, technology, sexuality and media, and her work is published in over 25 languages. Two of her books, Sexuality and Space in 1993 and Privacy and Publicity of 1995, have received the International Book Award by the American Institute of Architects. She has also curated numerous international exhibitions, most recently co-curating the third Istanbul Design Biennale in 2016 on the theme, Are We Human? The Design of the Species, and exhibiting an installation at the inaugural Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism in Seoul in 2017. After completing her studies in Spain, Beatrice travelled to the New York Institute for the Humanities in the 1980s as a visiting fellow, where she encountered the works of Wolfgang Schivelbusch, Karl Schorschke and Susan Sontag, whose interdisciplinary way of thinking has had an enormous impact on her. Sontag's Illness as Metaphor, published in 1978, made a strong impression and Beatrice started seeing modern architecture in relation to its pathologies, both real and imagined, agoraphobia, claustrophobia, tuberculosis, hygiene, germs and fresh air. This interest spanned decades and resulted in several essays and chapters before finally being developed into X-ray architecture, a newly published book and the focus of this evening's lecture. X-ray architecture explores the impact of medical discourse and imaging technologies on the formation, representation and reception of 20th century architecture. The relationship between private space and public space has changed dramatically in modern architecture, with many 20th century architects like Mies van der Rohe becoming preoccupied with exposing the inside of the, of the building to the public eye, exemplified through works such as his transper, transparent Friedrichstrasse skyscraper of 1919. In what ways and what, to what extent did the dominant medical obsession of its time, tuberculosis and its primary diagnostic tool, the X-ray, shape modern architecture? It's an intriguing question and I very much look forward to hearing Beatrice's exploration on this tonight. Will you please join me in welcoming Professor Beatrice Colomina to the stage. Well, thank you very much uh, to the team for the generous introduction and the generous invitation to come to your school. Happy birthday, 150. Hmm? That's really very impressive. And thank you, of course, to uh, Donald Bates, who has been so kind, taking me around to see Melbourne and, uh, and to all the people that have opened their uh, houses or have accompanied me to see uh, the colleges around here and, and all of the students that have been so wonderful sharing their uh, work with, uh, with me during these days. I'm really happy to, to be here uh, with you. 
Now, as the dean said, this is, uh, is a book uh, that has been with me for a very, very, very long uh, uh, time. In fact, I was going to read a little bit from the introduction, which basically talks about the fact that this bond between architecture and illness is uh, really my longest uh, uh, preoccupation that goes back precisely, as the dean was saying, to uh, the first year that I arrived in New York at the end of 1980, after having studied architecture in Barcelona, and by some impossibly good luck, I mean, you know, I think uh, I have had incredibly good luck in my life, frankly, um, I landed as a visiting fellow at the New York Institute for the Humanities, and among the extraordinary people that were there, it was Susan Sontag, whose book, uh, uh, Illness as Metaphor, had just been uh, published. And, and I started seeing modern architecture uh, in terms of all the pathologies related to it, real or imagined. So agoraphobia, claustrophobia, nervous disorders, and above all, uh, tuberculosis, and the obsession with hygiene, with germs, with fresh air, etc. And I thought that this would be a great topic uh, for a dissertation, and actually wrote some hundred pages of, uh, of it already in some kind of febrile uh, state, induced my intoxication, by my intoxication with uh, New York. But there was no climate for uh, such uh, uh, kind of interdisciplinary uh, research in architecture at the time, not in Barcelona, where I was doing my PhD, and not at Columbia University either, where I was a visiting scholar the following year. So I ended up working in, you know, on uh, modern architecture and, and, and mass media, photography, magazines, uh, film, and so on. Uh, as you know, this is what became uh, privacy and um, publicity, but what is funny retroactively is that at, the th at that time it turned out that the field of architecture was not prepared for that uh, either. Uh, and talking about media in architecture in the early 80s was kind of an anathema. It was like if it was a kind of an attack on the object, on the architectural object, or revealing a dirty secret, or even as if the media itself was some kind of illness. Right? And so returning to the project of, uh, of tuberculosis and modern architecture is for me in a way like uh, the return of the repress, a step that it has always been uh, somehow there in, in Latin form, like a virus that surfaces every now and then in essays and conference paper, but never completely takes over. Actually, I had to calculate the number of uh, articles that I have written on this question, and there were more than 12. By the time I sat down to, to, to do the book, I realized that half of the book has already been written without me aware that I was uh, writing it. Um, so this is what, in the end, I decided to do in my last uh, sabbatical, actually in Berlin at the American Academy. I was uh, prepared to work on something entirely different, but on, uh, on my first days in the Academy in, um, in, uh, in Berlin, I discovered that the area, Vance, had been actually uh, uh, an area where there were several tuberculosis uh, sanatoriums. Uh, the air was famously more clean, uh, uh, cleaner than, than in Berlin, and people from, from the area will come to Vance for the tuberculosis uh, cure. So I decided, or perhaps it was decided for me, I mean, I always think that my life, some many things, I don't, I'm not quite aware how they happen, uh, that I will change my topic and, uh, and take up again the question, this question that has been with me for such a long time. And of course, immediately I started myself imagining myself being in kind of an tuberculosis sanatorium there in Banse with all these other fellows that were uh, there. And as you will see, this is very much part of the culture of the tuberculosis. But before, to give you a little bit more of a longer uh, background, I will uh, uh, speak a little bit of what is in the first chapter, which is the longer view of this question of the relation between health and architecture. Because, in fact, uh, it's not just a question of tuberculosis. The uh, hypothesis of the book, the theory of the book, is that architecture and medicine have been uh, always uh, tidally uh, interlinked. Just as classical uh, theories of Greek polis, somehow um, uh, the Greek city, uh, follow the theories of the four humors, contemporary ideas of health organize the science theories even today. Uh, so architectural discourse, discourse on how weaves itself between uh, through theories of the body and the brain, constructing the architect as a kind of doctor and the client as a patient. For example, Vitruvius, uh, in the first uh, century uh, uh, already, launched Western architectural theory 
by insisting that all architects should uh, also study medicine. So if you think you don't have enough studying uh, architecture, all the students in the room, just imagine that you now also have to study uh, medicine. That's what uh, Vitruvius say. And actually he devoted a great part, uh, a large part of his first book on the of his ten books on, on, on architecture to the question of health, eh? giving detailed instructions on how to determine the health of a proposed site uh, for a city by, he says, returning to the ancient method of sacrificing an animal and inspecting the liver to make sure that, uh, that, uh, that it's sound and firm, right? And then, therefore, you can also do a city uh, there. And likewise, for the health of the, of the site and for the building, he discusses the theory, the Greek theory of the four uh, humors and emphasizes the directions of the winds and the sign and, and also talks about how much uh, in reverse, when one is unwell, one can be cured quickly, precisely through architecture, through design, right? And this is an aspect of uh, Vitruvius, which have, we have read Vitruvius all, in a school and nobody pays attention to this question of how much about health is in Vitruvius. And in talking about uh, how the building can help uh, uh, the person that is unwell, he talks precisely about those exhausted by disease, including consumption, his words. Consumption is, of course, another word uh, for uh, tuberculosis. So by the time uh, you get to, to the Renaissance, and despite all these treatises, this is uh, Cesare Cesarini actually translation of, uh, of Vitruvius, the central reference is no longer the whole body, despite all these bodies that appear in, uh, in these uh, buildings. But as you will see, uh, uh, the health is, is, uh, is uh, really uh, not determined by the, four, the theory of the four humors and a whole body, but a dissected, fragmented, and analyzed uh, body. The Renaissance schools of design had the habit of placing themselves next to the medical uh, schools, and in many ways they have the same problem. Uh, the, me the medical school had the problem of how to get a uh, body with the church opposing the idea of uh, dissection, etc., and bodies becoming very, very difficult to come by. And uh, the architecture school had the same problem. How do you bring a building inside another building to study the building? So they do what the school of the medicine was doing, which is do cast of body uh, parts. Well, the school of architecture starts doing cast of, uh, of body buildings. And, uh, and you have this phenomenon that goes all the way uh, into the 20th century. This is MIT, the first school of architecture in the United States. There's still many of these uh, casts uh, uh, around. But just as uh, Renaissance schools uh, 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 started start to have uh, body cast, they also started to uh, 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 study dissection, right? And actually at the first Academy of Design, the Academia del Diseño in Florence, uh, founded by Giorgio uh, uh, Vasari in 1563, uh, it was required that all students have to attend anatomical dissection at the local hospital nearby, the Santa Maria Nuova uh, Hospital, uh, as part of the training of the architectural students, and draw the body uh, as it putrefied, and, and even as some students and even professors were f uh, falling ill, you still have to be there drawing <laughs> for days on end this decomposed uh, uh, body. As doctors uh, uh, discovered that we, we, they could investigate the interior, the, this mysterious interior of the body by cutting it and dissecting it, huh. architects also try to understand at the same time the interior of buildings precisely by slicing cuts uh, through them. In the sketches, sketches of uh, sketchbooks of Leonardo uh, da Vinci, for example, you see cutaway views of uh, architectural interiors that appear side by side with anatomical uh, drawings. He even understood the interior of the brain and of the womb in architectural terms, as in closures that needed to be cut uh, through to reveal their uh, secrets. Is you, and this is another kind of uh, clear example of uh, medicine and, uh, and architecture. But as you move quickly into uh, the mid uh, uh, 19th century, you encounter people like Violet Le Duc, who illustrated his, illustrated his dictionnaire Resonne with these perspectival sectional cutaway drawings showing uh, medieval buildings as, uh, as dissected. He had been actually very influenced 
by uh, the lessons of anatomy of, uh, of uh, Cuvier, and he treated medieval buildings as a body to be analyzed. I mean, uh, he directly talks about an animate being and, and requiring dissection to understand uh, uh, how uh, buildings uh, uh, work. Well, as very quickly, as uh, this is again a, a medical illustrations, architectural illustrations uh, in Violet, uh, we can move quickly to the uh, 20th century because as medical representations changed, so did the architectural representation. And precisely in the 20th century, it was the widespread uh, use of X-rays that made a new way of thinking about architecture possible. Modern buildings even started to look like medical images with transparent uh, glass walls revealing the inner secrets of uh, structures. Uh, this is uh, uh, obvious when I say it, but of course these images have been seen by many people for many, many years without nobody noticing. Actually, that means was not only, and Le Corbusier, were not, you know, and all that generation of architects were not only, uh, uh, they were fascinated by x-rays, they collected x-rays. Mies has x-rays, Le Corbusier had x-rays, they published them in their books. And then you start seeing buildings that all of a sudden you have to look through, you are able to look through the skin into the inside of the building. In fact, Mies talks about his buildings as the skins and bones architecture in, had, in, in case we had miss, missed the point. Anyway, the architecture of the early 20th century cannot be uh, understood without grasping its relationship with disease and especially with tuberculosis, uh, a disease for which the X-rays uh, were by chance actually particularly well adapted as a means of diagnosis and monitoring of, uh, of um, symptoms. Anyway, so in this case, uh, uh, today, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to focus particularly on the question of, uh, uh, of tuberculosis, because one could, could write an entire book, actually an entire encyclopedia, just about the impact of tuberculosis on early uh, 20th century architecture, beginning with active collaborations, active collaborations between architects and doctors. We don't collaborate with doctors anymore, but this is still ha was still happening in the early 20th century in the design of tuberculosis sanatoriums such as Al Alvar Alto and Aino uh, Altos by Imio in Finland with its dramatic uh, terraces in, in the sky. The Paimio uh, sanatorium even has some kind of uncanny resemblance in a canonical photograph such as this one to an uh, x-ray of the, of the chest. Uh, with his clean uh, uh, line uh, bedrooms uh, uh, devoid of uh, ornament uh, that were designed to minimize surfaces where dust could accumulate, even the intersection of the floor and the, uh, and the wall beneath the window are curved. Eh? As you can see in this in this drawing, specifically to avoid uh, uh, the build-up of, of of dust, the rooms were also equipped uh, with all kind of uh, uh, sanitary fittings uh, that were designed by the architects, including chairs whose back was specifically angled to facilitate breathing and expectoration, uh, sinks designed to reduce uh, splashing, and espitons uh, to minimize uh, uh, sound. Also, door handles were carefully designed so not to catch up the sleeves of the doctor's uh, white uh, coats. But the building's uh, main equipment was this top floor uh, terrace. Uh, where is this noise made by my noise? This click, click, click. Eh? Bracelet. I don't have a bracelet. Ah, maybe it's the necklace. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I thought this is really weird. What is this noise? Okay, let's see if that helps. Okay, so the main equipment is this uh, uh, top terrace, seven stories uh, above the, uh, the forest, where patients were wheeled out for regular uh, doses of fresh air and, and sun in the long lounge uh, chairs um, that were specifically designed for Aino Alto. Here you have her uh, herself lying in the terrace in her own uh, the science here. Uh, see, the architect herself was a patient uh, in the uh, uh, sanatorium. Eventually, the terrace had to be closed off because actually the nurses couldn't keep up with the, the number of, uh, of uh, patients that were uh, uh, desperate and, and they would throw themselves uh, 
every time a nurse uh, uh, turn around. So, uh, so here you have this cure in which from early in the morning to late at night, patients will be there taking the fresh air, but at the same time it becomes kind of a form of assisted uh, uh, suicide, suicide because they will, uh, at, the, at the, you know, when they turn around, jump into, into the abyss. Uh, the discovery and success of uh, streptomycin in 1944 revealed that there was not a lot of scientific uh, basis for the air and sun uh, therapy. Sometimes it even precipitated the end and not by immune clearly, uh, literally. Tuberculosis actually made uh, modern architecture modern. It's not that modern architects did modern uh, sanatoriums, rather sanatoriums modernized architects. Alvar Alto, for example, was a totally neoclassic uh, architect until his conversion to modern architecture when he entered uh, the competition uh, that he didn't win for a tuberculosis sanatorium in King Koma in Finland, an unrealized project that in many ways uh, uh, anticipates uh, Paimium. For Alba Alto, the sanatorium was not architecture uh, in the service of medicine, but integral uh, to medicine, an apparatus device as a means of treatment. The main purpose of the building, he writes, is to function as a medical instrument. The room design is, so the building is a medical instrument, literally, that's what he's saying, right? The room design is determined by the depleted strength of the patient reclining in his bed. It's very important to understand that Alto had been himself sick at the time of the competition for the building and claimed that having to lie in bed for an extended period of, of time had been crucial to his understanding of the problem. Architecture, he says, he writes, has always been conceived for the vertical person, but here you have a client that is permanently in the horizontal. The whole design of the room uh, had to change, of the building had to change accordingly. Live fixtures could not longer stay uh, in the ceiling, kind of irrita irritating the eyes of the occupant uh, lying in bed for whom the ceiling eh, had all of a sudden acquired as an enormous uh, importance, a new kind of facade, if you want. The view through the window to the forest outside also has to be calculated from the point of view of the bed. In the terrace, low uh, uh, parapets and thin rails will allow the eye of the horizontal person to travel far above uh, the forest. Uh, the, the colors, of course, of the, of the rooms were also very important uh, to, to him. He talks about quiet, dark blues for the ceiling. He talks about bright canary uh, yellows in the reception booth by the entrance and the linoleum in the lobby, um, in the corridors, etc., evoking sunny optimism even in cold, cloudy days. Those are his words. Psychological factors were, of course, also very carefully uh, considered. An extended period of confinement, alto rise, can be extremely depressing for a bedridden uh, uh, patient. A tuberculosis patient, a sanatorium, sorry, is to all intents and purposes a house with open windows. And, and the other way around, to see if the hospital had to be a kind of, of house, he says also that the house has to be a kind of sanatorium. And this is the turning point that I found most fascinating uh, uh, in Alto. When he writes, I was able to discover that special physical and psychological reactions by patients provide very good pointers for ordinary uh, housing. To examine how humans being react to forms and construction is useful to use for experimentation, especially sensitive people, uh, such as patients in a sanatorium. The bodily and psychological uh, sensitivity of the sick person, therefore, is used to recalibrate uh, architecture. Even the specialized uh, furniture design uh, for Paimio became everybody's uh, uh, furniture. Is this cantilever uh, 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 chair, the birch wood of, uh, of Paimio, uh, was designed to open, as I say, the chest of the patients, allowing them to breathe easier, or that's what he says. Soon enough, this chair became everybody's chair. In fact, it's everybody's chair, even today. You can go and buy it for some uh, couple of thousand dollars or something uh, 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 like this. This is the interesting thing. He says that the sanatorium needed furniture which would be light, flexible, easy to clean, and so on. And after extensive experimentation, they came up with this idea of the flexible good uh, to produce furniture. He says that will be suitable for the long and painful life in the sanatorium, right? So he established 
uh, or they established, I know, and, and Alvar Alto, this uh, uh, workshop near the sanatorium where all the pieces of, uh, of furniture for the, for the hospital were produced. But very soon, eh, Artec, uh, two years after uh, Paimio, it turned into the uh, furniture company Artec, and all these pieces that were originally designed for the sanatorium became uh, pieces for everybody's uh, 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 house. The reference point uh, uh, for uh, for uh, for uh, Alto is clearly uh, the seriously ill. Uh, Alto claimed that architects have to design, and this is very important today when you think about all these uh, uh, new interests that we have, and, and clearly so, and rightly so, on disability studies. The tuberculosis patient, he just becomes the model for modern architect. The architect has to design for the person in the weakest position. So we are not talking all, all, all about these macho guys that are all uh, uh, kind of sporty and all of that. We have to design for the person in the weakest position. The tuberculosis patient becomes the model for modern architects. So, so in other words, sickness was no longer seen as an exception, but precisely as the norm, and varying degrees of uh, of sickness were seen to define the human condition. We are all kind of uh, handicapped in one way or, or another. The modern subject has uh, multiple ailments, physical and psychological, and architecture is a protective cocoon, not just against the weather and other outside threats, but in modernity, I mean, because we always think about architecture protect, protecting us from the elements. Yeah, sure they do, but more notably in modernity, is against internal uh, threats, psychological and bodily uh, ailments. Symptomatically, Alto compares his experiment and experiments in Paimio and their application to the everyday uh, use uh, and their application to everyday use to the exaggerated forms of analysis that scientists use in order to obtain more visible results. Uh, for example, uh, he says, stain bacteria for microscope examination. I think that's really interesting too because he saw clearly designed as a form of medical research with the sanatorium acting as a kind of research lab for modern architecture, a new way of testing architecture, looking at what has been hidden and exposing the invisible forces. And with that, I move into the invisible client of modern architecture. In fact, if you think about it, Sigmund Freud, uh, the X-ray, uh, bacteriology, and the germ theory of the disease were all uh, uh, emerging at the same time in the very short uh, uh, period of time, and they are all looking uh, about looking inside um, about the in, uh, the invisible, acknowledging the, invisi the invisible, whether it's the unconscious, the skeleton or the micro element of, uh, of bacteria, the bacillus of tuberculosis, for example. Architecture, and this is uh, very interesting, the first X-ray, which is the uh, hand of Bertha Rongen, which apparently had still had, uh, he, he was so worried that uh, his colleagues will, uh, uh, they, you know, find out that he was working on this, that he dragged his wife to the, uh, Bertha Rongen to the lab and made the first X-ray of her hands that becomes like the old image of, uh, of the X-ray. And then all of a sudden all this uh, aristocracy and all this, uh, no, no, they decided to have their own portraits and they all have the ring there. So the, the, the X-ray become like a new kind of intimate uh, portrait, portrait of the bourgeoisie and the intelligentsia during this uh, uh, period. Well, any, in any case, uh, if uh, during this period it's all about looking uh, inside, architecture also turns itself uh, as if we're inside out. The threat is no longer outside, but inside, in the invisible, the micro scale of the, uh, of the bacteria and the bacillus of the uh, uh, tuberculosis. Um, it is this micro scale of the bacteria that becomes the base for furniture, like this one, right? I mean, we are also concerned with uh, the accumulation of dust, right? And they have these incredible pieces of, of, uh, of furniture, uh, and also of our houses and of our cities. The micro, if you want, and the uh, micro, the bacterium and the city. Cities were suddenly thought to be teeming with an, uh, unseen uh, occupants that in a sense became the new clients of, uh, of modern architecture and urbanism. The, the micro is the new client. The architect doctor becomes a kind of a bacteriologist, generating design uh, principles out of a laboratory scrutiny of microbes. 
architecture itself becomes uh, bacterial. Le Corbusier had a very beautiful uh, quote in, in 1921. He says, I tried uh, uh, to do some laboratory work isolating my microbe. This is Le Corbusier writing in, 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 in very well-known books, but nobody sees that. I watched it develop. The biology of the my, my microbe appearing in indisputable clarity. 32 acquired, diagnosis, etc., etc. And then he goes on to talk about modern architecture and planning precisely in terms of these bacteria and these uh, microbes. Microbes uh, were both the literal and metaphorical basis of a new architecture and urbanism. Modern architecture, paradoxically, had to represent this new invisible order with bright, transparent uh, images seen as clean and clear and healthy in a kind of visual hygiene. In fact, the, the history of modern architecture is completely full of, uh, of, uh, of sanatorium. Think about, for example, Joseph Hoffman's uh, Purkesdorf uh, outside Vienna, this is 903. Uh, think about Otto Wagner, the Steinhof, think about the Queen Alexandra uh, Sanatorium in Davos in Switzerland of 907, uh, again by uh, uh, architects in collaboration with, with doctors and, and with engineers, the cutting edge of architecture, engineering, and, and, and medicine. Jan Ducker and Vigioe, Thonestral uh, Sanatorium in Hilversum, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Bab Lingen, Richard Docker Sanatorium in Bablingen, I mean, multiple uh, ones uh, in Barcelona, Jose Luis Sert, or this one here, William uh, 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 Gangster and William Spereira, Lake Country Sanatorium uh, in Bokegan, in Illinois. Many other examples, uh, endless uh, actually examples. Many uh, architects uh, did uh, uh, sanatoriums and somehow uh, 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 these sanatoriums defined them. The sanatorium was in a way the testing ground of new materials and techniques of construction and often invoke experimental collaborations, as I say, between architects, engineers and doctors. The sanatoriums were uh, typically uh, disconnected from the city, floating like ships in mountains, in forests, by the lakes, or the coast, with row upon row of sand terraces that were treated like uh, little beaches, sometimes linked to artificial uh, beaches, sometimes inside the building, like this artificial beach for kids in a sanatorium uh, in, in France, or uh, real beaches uh, on the outside. It is in a way, as if architecture itself was uh, taking the cure, when look, you look at these uh, uh, buildings adjusting themselves uh, to a, like a solar uh, device, sometimes, sometimes stacking themselves in a steep angle, like you can see on the, ref, uh, on the left in this uh, building of uh, Martel Breuer, uh, a 1930 project for 1,000 and 100 uh, uh, bed sanatorium, or even in a steeper angle, in this uh, Nicola Bisonti project for the Italian Alps, uh, as you know, with even the elevator at an angle. Uh, even uh, more extreme is this collaboration between a radiologist, uh, Jan uh, Simon, and the architect, André Fardet, to make a 25-meter-long revolving uh, sanatorium, <laughs> 16 meters above the ground, uh, that always face the sun for tuberculosis uh, patients, and then they do another one in, in in Jamagar, in India, and, and there you have all these, uh, these incredible, uh, sophisticated, retractable, retractable glass walls and, and specialized uh, focusing um, uh, instruments to increase uh, the exposure of the sun. Even the bed, as you can see, can be actually suspended in metal uh, frames and adjusted to, to be rotated to, to an angle to, to be aligned with the instruments and with the and with the sun, as you can see here. Um, the sanatorium actually had from the beginning been a laboratory uh, for incubating new attitudes towards uh, uh, form and a spatial organization. If you think about, again, going back to the, one of the first sanatoriums in the 20th century, uh, the Josef Hoffman Purkesdorf, with its purified white surface and radically sharp lines and cubic furniture. He used, uh, for the first time, Hennebic uh, uh, reinforced concrete uh, uh, construction and iron, and the first use of glass and electric electricity. Electricity was also considered extremely uh, hygienic. Uh, 
uh, not only was uh, uh, electricity considered more, more uh, hygienic than, than gas, of course, but it was used in all kinds of experimental uh, therapies, including electric uh, massage machines, electric bath and chairs uh, for strengthening the nerves. They, they talk about strengthening the nerves with all this electricity. It's kind of a torture machine. At the time of the Purkersdorf uh, uh, construction, the critic Ludwig Hebesi described it as the naked Hoffman building whose walls were lined with white porcelain tiles, a white painted or wild tile washable wall. Hebesi, the critic, was so enthusiastic as to check himself into the sanatorium to test personally some of these uh, therapeutic devices in the so-called mechanotherapy room. In this elegant white hall, he writes, full of artificial devices, which I made myself a uh, uh, close, uh, closer acquaintance, including the electric massage machines. Everything is electric. Electricity itself was understood to be a medical instrument. The building uh, was actually constructed as an addition to an early uh, sanatorium that was founded by the neuropsychiatrist uh, Richard Von Crafting Ebbing, who you see here with, uh, with his uh, uh, wife, uh, he died uh, before the Purkersdorf was completed, but he was, very, he was very influential in the ideas of the Purkersdorf. Uh, Kraft Ebbing had argued that the modern metropolis was damaging the nerves of its inhabitants and that air, light, nature and simplicity were the most effective uh, therapy. He wrote this uh, book over uh, Gesunde and Kranke nerves, so on healthy and, and sick nerves. It's, the nerves are very important in this uh, whole story. And a year later, he wrote uh, Psychopathia Sexualis. He also coined the term masochismo uh, after the author Leopold von Sacker uh, Masoch and popularized the term uh, sadismo. So once again, you can say that health was understood in psychosexual and architectural terms. The Purkerdos was uh, frequented by a notable uh, circle of patients that include uh, people like, uh, you can see on the, on the top uh, uh, left, Gustav Mahler, Arnold uh, Schomburg, Hugo von Hofmannsthal, Coleman Moser, who designed uh, the furniture, and many others. Even the architect himself, Joseph Hoffman, checked himself into the Purkerdos uh, uh, regularly. Apparently, uh, the architect uh, Hoffman had suffered himself from and was treated for a nervous uh, uh, disorder uh, prior to the commission of the Purkersdorf and was sympathetic to the Kraft Ebbing's ideas. And according to Edward Seckler, who, is the, who was the biographer of, uh, of Hoffman, it was precisely uh, because of this condition, this nervous uh, condition, we all have nervous conditions at that time, that he uh, was inclined to accept the commission. The Purkersdorf, by the way, uh, despite being a sanatorium, accepted patients with a variety of uh, a wide range of medical conditions, including, listen to this, nervous disorders, neurasthenia, eating disorders, substance abuse, and hysteria. So you may be there because you have tuberculosis, but you may also be there because you have uh, uh, all kinds of other uh, uh, problems. Nobody seems to have a, a problem uh, that you will be there for all kinds of things, and maybe you will check yourself in with a nervous disorder and come out with, uh, with tuberculosis, but nobody seems to think that that was any... <laughs> despite, I mean, I don't understand that, but never mind. The sanatorium, what is clear to me is that the sanatorium was seen as a kind of new uh, kind of social uh, a space for the Viennese uh, upper class and, and intelligentsia. They like to be uh, uh, there. Uh, actually, uh, this is Coleman uh, Mosher, uh, who designed uh, uh, the furniture and also checked himself into the sanatorium uh, now and then. I'm not so sure what he was uh, suffering from, but here you have him at the time of the, <laughs> of the commission of the of the of the of the sanatorium, he is the one that designed all this cubic uh, 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 furniture. And like Hoffman, he is also a regular uh, in the in the uh, in the Purkestov. Journalist and art critic uh, uh, Bertha Zuckerndorf, uh, uh, who was a critic actually for the newspaper Vienna Allgemeine Zeitung characterized the Purkersdorf as a cross between a modern hotel and a modern therapeutic uh, center. And Karl uh, Kraus 
um, uh, much more sarcastic, describe it as a healing a sw swindle institution, right? Critics uh, uh, hail uh, the building as one of clarity and truth. In fact, the success of the Purkesdorf owe enormously to the modernity of the architecture. Modern uh, was becoming a new and sophisticated taste among the bourgeoisie and the intelligentsia who were supposed to dine around uh, a single uh, white table at the Purkesdorf in a kind of talking uh, cure, sleeping what was seen at that time as really Spartan uh, white uh, rooms and subject themselves to regimes of treatment in white spaces like the ones that you saw before. The association actually of white uh, cubic forms uh, with mental and physical uh, health was already so strong for architecture to, art, uh, to act as a kind of uh, effective uh, placebo. The idea is also very much uh, clear in, in, in literature. If you read, for example, uh, Thomas Mann, uh, his short novel Tristan, um, who takes place, which takes place uh, nine, is nine o three, the novel, the same year of the construction of the Purkesdorf, uh, is set in an imaginary uh, sanatorial called the Einfried, which uh, Thomas Mann describes as a long, white, rectangular uh, building, warmly recommended for lamb patients, but also for patients of all sorts, like uh, Purkesdorf, sufferers of gastric disorders, people with defective hearts, paralytics, rheumatics, nervous sufferers of all grumblings. And when one of the patients in the novel, uh, uh, her cloth her hand's wife, ask another, why are you in the Einfred, really, what cure are you taking? Her Espinel, Mr. Espinel, he answers, cure? Oh, I myself, uh, I'm having myself electrified a bit. Nothing worth mentioning. I will tell you the real reason why I'm here, madame. It is a feeling for a style. Obviously, if people feel one way among furniture that is soft and comfortable and voluptuous and quite another among the straight lines of these table chairs and draperies. This brightness and hardness, this cold, austere simplicity and reserve strength, madame, it has upon me the big ultimate effect of an inward purification and rebirth. Okay, so here you have it clearly say in the words of uh, Thomas Mann, a style is really the cure for whatever ails uh, uh, Mr. Espinel, who, by the way, wears, according to the words of the novel, a white jacket and a, and a white hat in all this white building in a spotless white region, all covered in snow with white enamel chairs and white folding doors and white painted gallery inhabited by white faces and white hands of patients with their white veil desire by passion driven. Whiteness is actually the most insistent feature of the building, the landscape, and even the patients in this uh, Einfred uh, sanatorium. And with this, I move to another subject, which is the question of sadomasochism. Uh, Kraft uh, Evans' uh, uh, idea seems to have uh, been very influential in architects and urban planners. Think, for example, about uh, Camilo Site who criticized the design of the modern city because, in his view, it was causing agoraphobia and other nervous uh, uh, conditions. In his book, in his famous book, uh, City Planning According to Artistic uh, Principles, he advocated the return to kind of uh, intimate urban uh, spaces that, as in medieval times, protect, in his view, uh, the inhabitant. Adolf Loos, another student of masochism, if you want. There are multiple references to masochism in his writings. I don't know how nobody sees that. Argues that the man, he says, that the man with the modern nerves can tolerate, cannot tolerate uh, ornament. In fact, he gave a lecture in 1926 in the Sorbonne, four lectures in German on the subject precisely of the Man with the modern uh, uh, nerve, that means with modern and uh, uh, nerve. Uh, the subject of, of nerve had preoccupied uh, laws all his life and permeated his writing from the turn of the century. For uh, laws, the elimination of ornament is not simply an aesthetic choice, as we have thought for so long, but the more I read into it, the more I realize that for him it's a neurological or even a narcotic one. Adolf Loos argues that we moderns no longer have the nerves that are necessary to eat, dress, and decorate as in previous centuries. 
in ornament and crime, and a text that I'm sure you have read many times, he speaks precisely of his horror in front of the decorated animals in culinary displays, particularly if he thinks he has to eat one of these stuff animal courses, and then he says, I only eat roast beef, right? Roast beef being, of course, the, the abstraction of, of meat. He, feels, he goes on to say that he feels the same nausea, precisely, in the face of excessive ornament, whether it's in food or in architecture. He says, we like the nerves to drink from an elephant's ivory task on which an Amazon battle has been engraved. So we don't have the nerves anymore. It's not that we like it better, simple, um, without ornament. It's that we don't, we, have, we, we feel nausea. We, we, don't, we don't have the nerves. But uh, in fact, this uh, obsession, uh, I know, you, of course, when you see these portraits of uh, Kokoska of Lodz, you know that this is a very nervous, uh, clearly a very nervous man, check his, check his hands, huh? so he's totally into the, the nerves. But this obsession with the nerves, as I say, wasn't just a, a Viennese uh, uh, hang up in his glass architecture, uh, of 1914, Paul Serber wrote, uh, uh, and this is an interesting quote, two sanatoria will also want glass buildings. The influence of a splendid glass architecture on the nerves is indisputable. Indisputable. Nothing is indisputable. But of course, uh, he was obsessed himself with hygiene and with the removal of dust, pollen, and insects and all these things. He has this amazing telegram novella called the Mid-Ocean High Fever Sanatorium, in which he imagines floating islands with breathy, uh, colorful uh, uh, pavilions. This is uh, uh, some of the drawings of uh, Observer. Um, uh, everyone, he says, in America is plagued is plagued by hay fever. So during the flowering season, we will have to live in the middle of the, of the ocean. Our Oceanic Sanatorium Society for High Fever has found just the right thing. Floating islands that will drift uh, hundreds of miles away from dry land and natural islands on our islands, dirt will be non-existent. Um, Serbert uh, also saw uh, modern technologies as both the cause and the cure of illnesses. He writes that nerve uh, doctors uh, should prescribe the calming effect of color light in sanatorium. Already in 901, he speculated about air uh, sanatoria flying in the sky to deal with the nervous disorders again caused by the modern uh, city. But air technology, uh, which is at the center of Serber's utopian novels, is both a cure and actually a cause. In a pre-war uh, manifesto for pacifism written in 1914, he predicted that air uh, warfare, as the epitome, of course, of modern machinery, will generate general uh, insanity. Just thinking, he writes, about all these military techniques can have a deleterious effect on one's nerves. For him, at least, he was prophetic. He suffered a nervous breakdown over the carnage of World War I and starved himself to death in 1915, seemingly in protest. Since he had not taken part really on the war, it was as if just thinking, as he says, had indeed provoked his death. And with this, I move quickly to the architectural uh, cure. Davos in Switzerland, the site, of course, of Thomas Mann's uh, uh, famous novel, The Magic Mountain, was uh, uh, the epitome of the phenomenon of the modern uh, cure. They were in already in 1910, there were uh, as 20 and 26 sanatorium uh, already, including this uh, Swarth, for example, built between 1899 uh, and 1900, and the only sanatorium identified by, na by name in Thomas Mann's uh, famous novel, The Magic Mountain. It was, as I said before, one of these uh, incredible collaborations between a doctor, a cutting edge uh, uh, doctor, Louis, Lucius Spengler, and two young architects from Zurich, Flecker and Hafeli, with the engineer Robert Maillard, Maillard who has been working for Francois Hennebeek in, in France. It was the first building in Switzerland to be constructed in concrete and steel, so he, and it became actually the modern for the modern uh, uh, sanatorium. So you can see that the cutting edge in, 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 in medical treatment coincides also with the most advanced, advanced uh, uh, technology in architecture. The architecture of the Schwarz is, is totally brutal 
uh, uh, for us it's not, but uh, it was really totally brutal in its horizontality and abstraction with this uh, 100 meters long facade and endless uh, corridors that are a bit like an ocean uh, liner with these terrace that are dim dimension uh, for a patient reclining in these specially designed uh, chairs for the cure to be undertaken between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. in winter and in summer. So you have these period photographs with uh, doing kind of a nice uh, day with all these people attending, but you also have this period of photograph of a group of patients lying in the chairs, <laughs> totally <laughs> covering a thick uh, uh, blanket of snow, and, and they, you know, before all these attendants, and here they seem to be being left alone with the, with the broom <laughs> as, uh, as caretaker. And the funny thing is that they seem totally happy, like, like this one, you see that they are really mad. I mean, maybe this one in the middle is trying to see whether he can get something going, but not, it's, nothing, it's not going to happen, right? But look at this, look, like all of a sudden they're all like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, Thomas Mann, always uh, sensitive to architectural detail. If you read again The Magic Mountain, you will see it's completely full of uh, details of, uh, of what a modern building is, what uh, uh, it's a lot of architecture there. Describes the therapeutic chase long with, very, with a lot of care, evoking a philosophy of life on the edge and in the horizontal. This therapy of the horizontal was also central uh, to the Bald Sanatorium, also in Davos, where Katia Mann, Thomas wife has stayed and had inspired him to write the magic mountain. Man's uh, novel evokes the social life in this very modern uh, building where everything was wrapped uh, in white, even the patient here, uh, all wrapped in white to receive hydrotherapy. Katia Mann was actually, in fact, one of the first patients in this brand new sanatorium. She had fell ill in 1912, a year before, uh, or a year after, sorry, the birth of, uh, of her fourth uh, child. Her mother was convinced that she, Katia, was not suffering from tuberculosis but from exhaustion. Having had four children and two miscarriages in less than five years, managing a large household and even typing Thomas Mann uh, manuscripts. Katia, by the way, had been studying mathematics and experimental physics with Wilhelm Röntgen, and not, not less the inventor of the X-rays. And, but her mother had encouraged her to abandon uh, her studies to marry Thomas Mann at the age of 21. Whatever her ailment, she stayed in and out of sanatorium up to 1914, when she went back home and had two more kids. Bam. <laughs> Tuberculosis, in any case, was often confounded with nervous disorders of all kind, and its inevitable melancholy meant that the standard cure was also a psychological one. Sanatoriums offer somehow not just an escape from the city, but an escape from normal domestic life with the comfort of a control uh, regime and a steady jet distracting daily uh, rhythm in the company of new friends. These hyper-designed uh, spaces of the clinic even represented a new form of domestic uh, elegance. In fact, Katia Mann says she, the experience had strengthened her uh, so that she could stand it all. And of course, there was a lot uh, to stand. World War II, the exile to the United States, the suicide of her favorite uh, son, uh, uh, Klaus, and then the suicide of her second son, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, does one stand all of that? I don't know. In any case, the modern uh, ocean liner for the rich and, and fabulous becomes democratized eventually with sanatoriums such as the Thonestral uh, in Hilversum, 20 miles outside Amsterdam. Thonestral actually means uh, sun brain in Dutch. It was designed by Jan Ducker um, uh, BJA as a sanatorium for the General Diamonds Workers Union of the Netherlands. In this, again, reinforced uh, concrete white building, the medical properties of the architecture are again taken to the stream, almost as a kind of manifesto. Thonestral was a kind of health machine, a factory for the manufacturing of healthy bodies. This is the slogan, Lacked, licked, looked, allow air, sun, and uh, uh, light, air, and sun. So in many ways, like the manifesto of modern architecture. And here, the patients are also wheeled uh, directly from their uh, rooms into uh, the terrace 
which no longer is a kind of social space, but, but more like a, 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 there is less interaction with the patients, at least in this period, uh, uh, photographs keeping their heads into, into inside the room and into their uh, books. The real interaction here is with the sun and with the machines, these complex uh, uh, respiratory analysis uh, devices. The idea of uh, individual uh, rooms seems to have been an advance in working class sanatoriums, I thought. But then reading again Thomas uh, uh, Bernhard, whose uh, novels also are very, very important to me to understand uh, tuberculosis, because he spent many years in and out of uh, tuberculosis sanatoriums and uh, as a tuberculosis patient himself, and it infiltrates all his writings, then I became aware that there was nothing more terrifying to a sanatorium patient than being moved to an individual room. That could only mean one thing. Death itself was uh, hidden. Sanatoriums in Davos and in other places did not accept very ill patients. Uh, they, they, were, uh, they, they would not accept you. Uh, a death was, of course, a spot in their reputation, and they even exaggerated the, the rate of cure. Subterranean tunnels carried the dead away and out of view, and at the south, which is 30, 300 uh, meters uh, above the town of Davos, the bodies of the, bed, of the dead were sent down uh, the mountain on toboggans in winter, as Thomas Mann writes in The Magic Mountain. Already in Tristan, in the novel that I mentioned before, Thomas Mann has written, sometimes a death takes place among the most severe cases. When this happens, no one knows it. Not even the person uh, sleeping next door. In the silence of the night, the waxen guest is put away and life at Einfried goes tranquilly on with his massage, his electric treatment, the duches, the baths, his exercise, his steaming and inhaling in rooms especially equipped with all the triumphs of modern therapeutic. Right? So uh, there you, ha you have it. Death in, in, in modernity is always hidden. Visual hygiene also means designing that you don't see or, or what you don't want to, uh, to see. Otto Wagner, for example, uh, plan for the Grostad, for the big city of 1911, included high-speed trains, and you may want to know in a little second what was the rush, that were to remove the dead, transporting corpses in their coffins from specially designed mortuary stations to the cemeteries in the outskirts of the city, far away and very fast. Eh? Every large city, he says, will soon be in a position to limit the transportation of courses to railroads. And, and therefore, in each uh, uh, neighborhood, there should be a mortuary station where you send the, the bodies away. And of course, you can also think about uh, Brasilia with the hospitals uh, at the very far end of the two uh, arms of the, of the city. We don't want to, to see uh, uh, death. But uh, to finish, perhaps we can talk about how uh, more significant I think that the uh, architecture of the sanatorium as medical instrument is the impact of medical thought on all of modern architecture, the constant preoccupation with ventilation, with sunlight, with hygiene, with white walls. Uh, as Ulrich, the uh, figure of uh, Robert Musil, the man without qualities, put it in his novel, uh, of, um, which is about 1913 Vienna, Modern man is born in a hospital and dies in a hospital. Therefore, he should also live in a place like a hospital. Right? <laughs> this <laughs> Musil was probably referring to Otto Wagner, who also had formulated the idea that modern man should live in a place like a hospital. And he claimed that the hotel room should not be very different than a, than a hospital room with white surfaces that should replace the upholstered interiors of the 19th century, where dust accumulates and illness is latent. So at the very beginning of the century, you have all these architects always obsessed with the idea of the, uh, of the uh, health. Very quickly, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I'm going to cut through here, but just to go to the fact that, in fact, every building in the, in the end becomes uh, a kind of sanatorium. Take, for example, the open air school in Amsterdam, built a couple of years after Thonestral by the same architects, Ducker and Bijoué, and who apply the principles of light, air, sun, but not to healthy. Uh, uh, children. They were placed inside this uh, glass machine and even required to sit up in, in, the, in, the, in the roof, uh, taking the air and, uh, and the sun. So the building is conceived as a light device 
uh, very much like those used uh, for light therapy in the 1930s in places that they didn't have enough sun, like uh, in this image that we use in the publicity, right, of, uh, of kids in a school going through all these uh, um, uh, machines uh, to uh, provide uh, 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 sun uh, therapy. Nobody seemed to be thinking anything about uh, uh, skin cancer, right? That will become the next, the problem of the next generation that was always like, is this, uh, is this right or is this, is, should I check this one out or not, right? So every, every, every age has its own uh, health uh, obsessions and, and, and preoccupations. Okay, so how could I finish? Maybe I finish with um, a story that maybe you like uh, very quickly. Uh, about uh, um, uh, the two and half house, uh, because not only did modern architects emphasize health and exercise in opposition to the dangers of the disease, sometimes presenting themselves as models, but their architecture was also understood that way. The buildings become unconsciously identified uh, with the healthy body. For example, you have here uh, Miss van der Rohe two and half uh, house, which is not just in Brno in Czechoslovakia, which. It's not just a modern house, but the Ur modern house in the cover of the great exhibition of modern architecture of the Museum of Modern Art in 1931 that became popular with the book The International Style. In the catalog, they have the image of the two and had in the front, and in the, in the uh, first edition of The International Style, it's still the two and had uh, in the back. Well, the story that, uh, that interests me is uh, that the building, of course, was abandoned uh, during the uh, German occupation of, uh, of Czechoslovakia, and when it was uh, taken over by the communist bureaucrats, they said, what do we do with this weird building? Okay, what do we do? We turn it into, into a hospital for the children with, uh, a rehabilitation center for, for children with, uh, with disabilities. In fact, uh, here you have uh, uh, this uh, living room uh, of the two and a half uh, house with these uh, 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 kids with orthopedic uh, problem uh, exercising. In fact, um, before uh, this, it was turned into, uh, into a, a kind of physical education institute uh, uh, where you have all these kids uh, uh, and, and young people uh, using uh, the house, this is the terrace actually of the two and a half, and what they, these bureaucrats of, of uh, communist bureaucrats in, in Czechoslovakia didn't seem uh, to realize is that actually the house had been photographed in its early years in exactly uh, the same spirit. You see early 1930s photographs of the naked uh, uh, two and a half kids playing in the, in the sun in the terrace, which of, of course are uncannily echo in the 1950s uh, images of children exercises in the living room or the terrace of the house. The two and a half themselves, the clients may have understood the house as a machine for health too. In response to an architectural critic that uh, had polemically asked in the pages of an architectural magazine, is the two and a half house habitable? Um, Fritz uh, two and a half symptomatically invoke uh, Davos. Nobody has asking him about the sanatorium, but he says the following. After almost um, a year of living in the house, I can assure you without hesitation that technically it possess everything a modern person might wish for. On clear and frosty days, one can lower its windows, sit in the sun, and enjoy the view of a snow-covered landscape like in Davos. Like in Davos? In Davos, in a sanatorium. So in winter, the family, he describes, will sit by the big glass in the living rooms. We could lower into the ground. As you know, the whole panel of glass can come to the ground until it disappears completely, completely, taking the sun and the fresh air with the snow outside, like in Davos, like in a sanatorium. These photographs of the, of the, of the kids playing in, and running around naked in the garden evoke the ideas of the Levens reform movement uh, too. But Fritz Tuenhardt apparently, and this is also an interesting discovery that I, I, I did doing this research, he himself was not in good health at the time of the commission uh, of the house and may have commissioned uh, this house with this in mind. Mies himself recalls he was a very careful man and he was sick. He did not believe in one doctor uh, only, he had three. 
I, and this is kind of interesting because MIS didn't seem to, to realize that this was actually not that unusual. And certainty in the early 20th century about the new scientific uh, medicine made it commonplace among the bourgeoisie and people who could afford it to consult different kinds of doctors and alternative uh, practitioners and to follow multiple advice. In a way, uh, I have the sense that the architect was added as a new kind of, uh, another kind of, uh, uh, or yet another medical uh, consultant. And with this, I leave you uh, here. Thank you very much. Beatrice for an absolutely fantastic lecture and thank you all for attending this very special Dean's lecture this evening. Uh, we're now holding a reception out in the foyer that you just passed in to come into this theatre to celebrate Beatrice, Beatrice's visit to the faculty and you're all welcome to join us for some refreshments and to continue the conversation more informally. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>